Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trailline Podcast, brought to you by DFU. I'm your host, Richard Moglin, and joining us today is Tom Basso, a very experienced trader of multiple decades. Uh, he was featured in New Market Wizards by Jack Schwager, and he's a published author with multiple books, including the all-new All-Weather Trader. So, Tom, uh, thank you mu- so much for taking the time to speak with us today, and, and welcome. It's always great chatting with you. Yeah, it's fun to be here, Richard. Last time you had some good questions. I hope you have some good ones today. Well, I'll, I'll shoot for that for sure. And then just overall, you know, how's everything been going recently? Uh, what have, what are kind of your thoughts on, on um, the markets and, and everything? Right that- now on a, a little drawdown, the stocks have been kind of going sideways, uh, sort of range bound. I don't have the hedges on, but the market's trying to struggle higher. And yet it doesn't seem to be a full blown, you know, massive bull move or anything. I've got, I usually... Uh, take a glance at my sector uh, timing and ETFs and I trade 30 different sectors. And the reason I like to just get an approximation is that's a, sort of a long-term trend following model and it's measuring different sectors of the stock market. Right now I'm long 14 of the 30, which is less than 50%. Mm-hmm. And that's an indication that the market in the stocks is not full blown widespread it's picking its uh, segments that it wants to, you know, run up. And then there's other ones that are getting killed. I mean, regional banks are making new lows. It, there's lots of different sectors that are just struggling like crazy. So it's been a very bifurcated situation, very strange to me. And uh, so I've just been dealing with that. And uh, futures have had their, you know, bright spots. Cotton's made a, a good move. Uh had some good money out of orange juice, coffee. Nice. Uh, Lumber has made some nice moves. Um, bonds have they made some nice moves with all the Fed doing their thing. So there's been some bright spots there. That's kind of uh, buffered the portfolio. Um, you know, the, the credit spreads in options um, typically are doing well during the sideways. So that's picks up a few pennies here and there. And uh, other than that, uh, I guess my short-term futures trading would probably be uh, a bright spot a bit in that as you get very short moves, that those indicators are so sensitive that I can try to almost scalp some money out of the markets on very short-term time frames. So I'm getting a lot of break-even trades or slight profits. There, It's a lot of work for very little money, but... Um, it does buffer the portfolio a little bit. So Yeah, it fills those potholes as you kind of get into in your book. And um, oh, you did read the book. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and, and we've talked about that in previous interviews as well. Um, yeah. and, and just to add some perspective for people who maybe aren't super familiar with kind of you, your history and, and your work, uh, you kind of would you kind of classify yourself as a systems trader, somebody who kind of develops systems that trades multiple markets? Uh, in your book, you talk about, you know, trading multiple time frames, uh, stuff that's not correlated, um, you know, stuff that works in different situations, sideways markets, trending markets, all that. Uh, yeah. How would you kind of describe your your own overall style and and maybe touch a little bit? Obviously, we've talked about before about how you got into that that style of trading. Yeah, it all started with chemical engineering, because uh, one of the first courses you take as a chemical engineer is process engineering. And isn't trading a process. You, you've got data coming in, you're processing data, you're shipping out orders. It's, what's the difference between that and bringing in chemicals, processing the chemicals and shipping out tank cars or pipelines or whatever. And so I always thought of trading in that kind of mental framework. And just like, uh, like a chemical factory that you have different products that you produce. And so just like in the portfolios, I have some long-term trend following with uh, the sector timing of ETFs. I've got, uh, you know, trading some NASDAQs on a shorter term timeframe, nine days, the indicators there. I've got some crypto futures trading I've mixed in recently in the last, I guess, year and a half, two years. Uh, Things like uh, longer term futures across 26 markets gives me vast amounts of diversification, which is great. And uh, some short-term futures trading to try to uh, play the counter trend move off of an overbought, oversold situation to try to help buffer the 
potholes, as you said, um, uh, in the track record where the long-term trend following is just simply getting back to its stops and takes right. a drawdown doing that. If I can jump on a trend in the opposite direction, sort of a counter trend move, if you will, then, but still trend following, um, just very, very short term trend following. So it looks from a distance like counter trend trading, but I, I view it as very, very short term trend following and, and handle it that way. And when you get that going, that's buffering some of these pullbacks and keeping track records a lot more stable. So I do a lot of things and I try to automate what I can. Uh, because as as you would as a process engineer, you would uh, always try to be more and more efficient. So I'm always trying to apply my math, statistics, and engineering skills to the process of getting through my trading day as efficiently as possible and as reliably as possible with backups in place if I you know have a computer go down or have the internet go down and the power goes down or any of these things. Uh, I think that's kind of the way I approach trading. And I have all my life. So uh, this is just kind of where I've arrived uh, at this point in time. And I'm still trying to automate more things and still trying to add new strategies. And, um, you know, I don't know what number 10 is yet. I'm still thinking about that, but I'm up to nine now. And uh, of those six of them are completely automated. And one of them is about to go live with the first testing this week. Oh, cool. so later on in the week and so i'll be up to seven out of nine and the other two just don't lend themselves to automation they're just once a week or once in a blue moon type things i have to do and it's doesn't lend itself to it yeah perfect and uh yeah your your kind of process and overall view of the markets really appeals to me because i've also kind of got them uh, i've got mechanical engineering background which is funny i think in your book you talk about how uh, chatting with mecha some mechanical engineers over lunch kind of got you started thinking about all this. So uh, yeah, credit to the mechanical engineers out there. Um, but uh, yeah, and and I really enjoyed your flow chart in your book that kind of describes the overall system. You know, uh, that reminded me so much of doing problems where, you know, we're describing a um, thermal system or whatever with all the different components, you know, all the different compressors and everything that you have to go through. And it's a, it's a good way of, you know, take into account the whole system, because I think there's there's some perspective when people, when they first get into systems trading, it's just a buy sell engine, right? You, you just have to buy here, sell here, but it's a lot more than that, right? And and that's kind of yeah. the key theme of your book. You got to you gotta think of the nuances, the position sizing, how to deal with volatility, all of that. So yeah, I, I love if you could kind of expand on that and, you know, what it takes to build a system because- yeah, yeah, I was floored way back when. I had no idea. Uh, I really didn't. But when uh, Larry Height talked about in uh, Market Wizards, actually, in the first book, about making your bet sizes the same or betting the same risk, I think he said, or something like that, uh, on every trade, I started thinking about, well, risk changes all over the place. So what he's doing is changing his position size to accommodate different risk structures on each trade. That makes a lot of sense that he would say that, but I wonder how that would simulate out. So I immediately set the guys uh, in the computer department over at Trendstat um, to do a with position sizing and without position sizing run. And I was floored at how much it improved my results when I had position sizing in there. Mm -hmm. My return to risks went up. My drawdowns were lessened. It did shave a tiny bit off my returns. I'll admit that. But for the smoothness, no question. I want uh, I want that smooth. I, and, and the clients want the smooth. I Peace of mind. Not. I mean, clients are all about returns. But if you have to go through nightmarish ups and downs to get there, you'll never keep your clients. The clients will leave you. And so all your good work is for naught mm -hmm. is you're managing no money. So I had to try to go into my client's head and say, well, what are they able to tolerate and how can I adjust all these position sizing algorithms to be able to create track records that they're interested in and will stay around for a long term? Uh, today, my own objectives are a little different than when I was managing money for clients. I can tolerate far more risk, but being in retirement, I don't quite have that need. 
Mm-hmm. So it's sort of, um, I, I try to keep things pretty easy to do and pretty smooth as possible uh, so that I have a nice retirement situation. I don't have to get concerned over uh, going back to work or something like that with a blow up. And, uh, but a complete trading strategy, if you really look at it, once I got position sizing in there, then there was the aspects that clients would ask me, well, what happens if you're so automated? What happens if the electricity goes off? Yep. And what happens if the internet goes down? What happens if you lose, you know, so-and-so, your head trader, you know, keels over? Uh, how does that affect everything? They, and then those are all legitimate, good questions. And you start thinking through, all right, well, you know, why don't I design a disaster day where I take half the crew and we go to a disaster location, try to run the company off of backup computers and backup software and everything else, and then take lots of notes because it's amazing what you find out when you're trying to run a backup and then run the crew, the other half of the crew, a skeletal crew would stay at Trendstat and continue to run the normal stuff every day. So we could compare notes at the end of the day and learn a lot about what we didn't have prepared well and get better at it. And uh, I think a lot of traders should try to do that. I, I know that I have had to run uh, off of my laptop in a Safeway cafe off of their internet uh, my processes. And it was not easy, but I got through it. Um, if you don't have backups like that, man, the stress levels just go through the roof and you can't be Mr. Serenity if you have a lot of stress. So uh, I try to think through those things. And I, you know, I talk about that in the book and, uh, you know, the, the, the kid that gets sick at school and you get the call from the nurse saying he's in the nurse's office and we can't get him back in class because he's, he's really sick. Uh, somebody's got to come pick them up, something like that. And, you know, you're day trading. All right, well then what's your plan? Right. Um, I had just the other day, I was doing some day trading while I was uh, working on, I guess it was something for the new house remodel. I was working on some electrical drawings on some CAD cam that I had on my computer. So over on my other screen over here, I'm doing a little day trading. And I just had put orders in. And the orders were about to get hit when my wife called and said something about, I was in the golf cart and it just slammed to a stop right at a busy intersection. And I'm safe and over on the side of the road, but the golf cart is still out there and I don't know what to do. So (laughs) cancel, 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 (laughs) jump in the car, go save the golf cart. Um, that's life, you know, that's what happens and trading and life have to coexist somehow. So I think a lot of traders have this vision of, you know, from wall street, all the movies and about how, you know, you're supposed to be stressed and chain smoking and an alcoholic and doing drugs and everything else, trying to, uh, get through a trading day. And reality is, is that as long as you have good plans in place and you, and you're dealing with all the different life's uh life's twists and turns uh it doesn't have to be like the movies yeah you can yeah have- absolutely and yeah like uh just uh a week and a half ago or so my internet went out and my backup plan is my mobile hotspot on my phone and that worked fine uh but i also you know quickly looked up you know where's the nearest starbucks where's the nearest like internet cafe because yeah. uh yeah it's kind of a critical thing that you don't you don't realize you need until you really need it. Right. Yeah. Um, so planning in advance, I, I think that's super important with all the contingencies. So sure. yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And one thing you start out with your book um, that I want to touch on is you say we are all traders. So that's kind of including, you know, all market participants, even, you know, investors. What, what exactly do you mean by that? And, and yeah, could you kind of expand on, on that concept? Well, in, in my view, even Warren Buffett is a trader. He would argue that he's an investor. Mm-hmm. I would say trading encompasses buying and selling over some time frame. Mm-hmm. He has been known to buy and sell companies over a lot longer term time frame. So I'd call him a long term trader. Uh, but that's some of the same concepts in terms of he can't go out and buy too much of a company that ends up destabilizing uh, Berkshire Hathaway. He's mm-hmm. got to be reasonable. He's got to look at his cash. He's got to keep diversified. He's got to manage the portfolio of all the companies that he owns. 
isn't that the same as what I talk about in my position sizing book or in this book? Uh, doesn't he have to uh, have discipline? Doesn't he have to deal with the mental side? He's got the pressure of all those Berkshire Hathaway people, uh, you know, yelling at him when he's got a an off year where not too much happens and maybe he's down a little bit and they think, oh, he's lost his touch. No, he's doing the same thing he was always doing, but that he's got to deal with those stressors or potential stressors, I would call them, because they're only stress if you let the stressor become stress. Mm -hmm. You have a choice in that, I, I think. But uh, he's got to deal with all the mental sides. He's got to deal with, you know, making the big decision to go in and buy, you know, $40 million worth of some company or $200 million. That's a lot of money to throw around and you got to get it in there over probably weeks can't just dump it all on the market in one hour and expect to get filled. So he's got all the different aspects of trading that all of us have. And if he wants to consider himself investor, that's fine. But when you put the word investor on you, it seems to me it's like an excuse to be lazy and not think through some of the important aspects like position sizing, like uh, having your objectives exactly defined so that you know what your exit strategy is and when your exit strategy is. And I think you you just start turning the brain off and say, well, I'm just a long-term investor. I like this company and I'm just going to stay with it. And then you watch it go down 50% and, you, and you're starting to think, hmm, this company's struggling now. And, you know, do I sell out or do I hang on? You know, like, what? And, and then you're out, you get all this angst. Mm -hmm. And if you were a trader and you had all that well-defined, you'd either be out or you'd know that, hey, it still hasn't met the criteria for me to exit. So I'm going to suffer through the 50% down and stay with it. But you would be very clear-headed about that. There wouldn't be any stress about it because you're still on the plan. If you don't have a plan, it's you're just making it up as you go, erratic performance, uh, erratic uh, levels of anxiety in your day, all sorts of mental things come to play that you just don't want as a trader. Yeah, you don't want to introduce randomness and and that then the emotions pick up and all of that. It's kind of a, you know, it's a downward cycle almost. Yeah. And, exactly. and what would you suggest for people who are more long-term minded uh, who maybe, you know, classify them themselves as investors, how can they mitigate risk and attack risk and make sure that, you know, one, one investment can't, you know, take down the entire portfolio and they've got, they've got systems in place. So, you know, they can manage things and, and overall long-term they'll be successful. Well, what I do in longer term type strategies that I'm running for myself uh, is just to try to push out the time that I'm measuring with my indicators. So in the case of my sector timing ETF thing, uh, my stops uh, on the long positions are running 50 day indicators. Mm -hmm. That's getting to be, you know, there's about 21 trading days a month. So 50 days is kind of like two and a half months of data that I'm smoothing out and ignoring pretty much everything inside that. So when you're starting to measure out, you know, two to three months, of data, you're going to get rid of a lot of the little ups and downs that you see the market goes through, and you're going to pick up every major bull market, and you're going to avoid or short every major bear market. Uh, but you're not going to trade a lot, and so your tech situations, you're going to get a lot of uh, positions that maybe get to long-term capital gains. Uh, so it's tax efficient and it's also doesn't require a lot of work except to update the indicators every day and then move your stops appropriately and you're done. It's pretty easy. So that's the first thing that you can think about. The second thing you can think about is to protect yourself as a long term investor is to position size according to the risk levels. If you are going to do a long term indicator, you're going to have larger risk per share or a larger risk per contract if you're trading futures on each of position. And mm -hmm. when you have a large risk per unit, you want to have a smaller position size commensurately. So, you know, simple example, you take a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, you, you decide I'm going to risk 1% 
or something uh, to any one position. So you want to buy X, Y, Z, and uh, one percent of a hundred thousand is one thousand. And let's say just to make the math easy, uh, the stop loss from from where you're going to get in to where the stop loss is is a thousand dollars per share. Well, you only can take a thousand dollars per position. So how many shares should you buy? One. Mm -hmm. And just do that and keep doing it across a lot of other things. Could be some futures contracts you could mix in. Uh, do it like I'm doing with sectors. I got 30 different sectors and I got 14 of them long and I've got 16 of them uh, out and in money markets right now. So you've got a very bifurcated market, but the ones that are going down, I'm just sitting in cash and letting them fall. And if this market caves in and the rest of the 14 go to cash, I'll be totally in cash and I'll have hedges on if I need to have any long exposure hedged. So I've got plans in place to deal with it. And a lot of people just, they put it out of their mind and uh, yeah, they kind of know that there's bear markets, but they haven't seen one in a while. So we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> We're just going to go along and hope for the best. And it's sort of like, gambling i mean it's like another pull of the slot machine or something it's a weird mentality i prefer to to try to have plans in place for just about whatever the market could throw at me and uh, it's just a whole lot easier on the mind that way for sure and yeah i think you know given the bear market we just kind of experienced or maybe still in you know depending on how we do from now people are kind of learning that and you know there's the there's the common um idea that you have to have your money working for you all the time and if you're not in you're going to miss the bottom and all that but you're trying to you're trying to get the trend you're not trying to pick the exact bottom which kind of it sounds like your systems are in place so you know once that trend is established and you know it, it it's working that's when you enter and you try to catch that longer term move you know out out of any correction after, out of any drawdown like that um, with yeah. more capital because right. you preserved it right if you preserved your capital, then when you get to buy again next time at lower prices, you can buy a lot more shares now. Maybe you buy two shares of that example that I just gave you instead of uh, one. But uh, yeah, it's it's to me, it smooths out your track record, smooths out your mentality, and you have a plan. I mean, the market's going to go through up, down, and sideways. Yep. And I think a lot of people just lock on to the up. For some strange reason and we've had a lot of up in the last decade probably more than uh the last hundred years statistically it's been concentrated to the upside and with inflation i think stocks do have an upside bias that's why i run 21 days to get in 50 days to get out so i biased it to the upside but that being said bear markets you know 50 percent down eh, i don't want 50 percent down in my retirement account yeah, that's that's not uh, going to be a, a good period of time. So knowing that, knowing that there's bear markets that come along, why not create some strategies to exploit bear markets? My NQ uh, timing that I mentioned in the book is a nine day set of indicators. And I go long and short. It's really easy to do. It takes me seconds every day. And it's even automated, even though it only takes seconds. And uh it's easy to automate because it's so simple. And uh, it gives me an exposure both directions on a shorter term time frame. And I pick up every major move with it, up or down. And so if the market's crashing and NASDAQ's crashing, I'm cleaning up. And that's helping offset other you know losses in other parts of the portfolio. And it's all good to keep it stable. Yeah, that was that was a cool thing reading your book. Uh, you didn't, you know, obviously you trade multiple markets. You mentioned crypto futures, all that, but you also trade different time frames, which helps you know fill in those drawdowns even more. Because you know, if um, we're kind of trendless overall on a longer term time frame, those short term strategies are going to be working for you in that range, and you know that just helps buffer the portfolio as other other strategies are basically taking a rest. So uh, yeah, I, I thought that was super cool. And, um, you know, for me as a more discretionary trader with um, my time frame is more, you know, swing trading, position trading when the market is good, I've had to kind of shorten up my time frame naturally to take it, you know, take profits a little bit quicker, tighten up my risk. So I'm kind of doing a little bit of the same thing of adopting a slightly different strategy to adapt to the market that 
you know, we're experiencing at the time. So yeah, I, I thought that was a really cool concept that, yeah. that you chat about it. Yeah, it, I, different time, different markets, different time periods, different indicators. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I have basically four different time periods from very, very short term, like a day or two for the indicators all the way up to nine, then to 21, then to 50. Those are kind of where I concentrate a lot of the work just to separate the time frames out. Right. And so if you think about what that means, it's like two weeks, well, it's daily, two weeks, maybe about a month and maybe about two and a half months. Yeah. That's sufficiently stretched out that uh, beyond that, now you're getting almost close to buy and hold. Uh, you know, you start doing 100, 200 day indicators, you're really stretching your decision making out into the years, Yeah, which I'm not against. If somebody wants to do that, and it's perfectly legal and okay to do it. Uh, just not my, I'm a little more heads on than that. And I do have the time being retired to be a little more active. Um, so but the diversification by markets too. I mean, geez, I'm at 26 futures markets. I've got 30 different sectors and ETFs trading crypto futures on top of that and NQs. And um, there's a lot going on at one, any one time, if it's fully loaded, I'm probably up to about 60, 62 positions or something in the portfolio with nine different strategies. And so there's, there's a lot of stuff going on <laughs> under the hood. Yeah, for sure. And so if if you had to start from scratch, you don't have your your nine strategies that you have right now. What would be the first steps you would take to start investigating and developing your strategies, you know, over again? What what, what would be the first things you do in order to very, develop a, a systematic strategy? The very first thing you got to do, and I know a lot of traders think that they've got the key to success and they're trying to even run seminars about this is the way you should trade. I have a very strong opinion. The first thing you should do is just sit down and take out a sheet of paper and figure out everything about what you're about to embark on, almost like a business plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trading is business. You got to have your risk controls and you got to have whatever personnel you need. If you need to hire a contract, Uh, computer help because you're going to automate things. All right, where do you get that help? How much are you going to pay? What's it going to cost? How long is it going to take? What types of things are you going to automate? What types of things are you not going to automate? What are your objectives? Before you start, if you don't know where you're headed, you're never going to get there. It's going to be a complete mess. So your first thing is not to sit down and start looking at buy sell engines. It's Mm -hmm. to figure out what are you trying to create here? And I would also really, really encourage people to think about their life, you know, you, your family's life. What do you do with a trading strategy when you're on vacation? Uh, there's the normal things that you do with your life have to coexist, their trading has to coexist with them. I like to think of it as the other way around. But if you haven't thought that through and you design something that, yes, it appears to make money, but it's in constant conflict with everything else in your life, you're going to have a heck of time being being successful with that because it's there's going to be this battle going on all the time for your attention and your time and all that. So what I've tried to do right out of the gate is design everything I do to fit into right now, it's running about 35 minutes roughly on a normal day that I take, even if I'm on vacation, like this afternoon, we're going to uh, get my afternoon run down, and then we're going to go down to a staycation down in Fountain Hills. And tomorrow I will be out at the pool most of the afternoon, probably, and enjoying life after a massage in the morning. And but comes about three o'clock, I will be going back up to my room and doing about 40 minutes of work, and then I'm done. Mm-hmm. And my wife knows that I need those 40 minutes and it's already pre-planned and we've worked it out. So the objective is to get that down to 15 minutes eventually. And I think this next week, we're going to start up the next module of the automation, then testing that, which will take some time to to bless and make sure that it's doing what it needs to do. Uh, It's a little more complicated strategy in this case, so it's a little harder to program it. But, um, you know, when that gets up and running, I'll be down to 15 minutes or less. And then... I can be on a cruise ship 
and start the process, it runs in the cloud and then I'm done. Right. And I don't even need good internet anymore. So the data is coming in over the cloud, the process is running in the cloud, the orders are being sent from the cloud. So there's, it's a well thought out project to try to get my time trading each day down to the minimum I can do so that I can enjoy golf and enjoy retirement and, you know, uh, answer questions <laughs> from interviewers like you. Exactly. Perfect. And once people have kind of defined their objectives and kind of what they want out of a trading system, uh, what would be the steps after that to, you know, define how you would manage risk, how you would attack that, uh, as oh, well as the, the buy and sell part? Part well, of I would pay close attention to the complete trading strategy flowchart uh, after the after you've done some homework on what are my skills, what are my, what's the dollars I've got, how much time can I take, how's this integrate with my family, what are, you know all these different issues. Then I would go and ask yourself, what are you doing now with your money? Chances are you've you know worked with a broker and you've got a stock portfolio or something. You haven't just kept your money in cash. And so start with where you are and ask yourself, is that really what you want to do if you have your choice in getting this process going? Or do I want to diversify it more? Or do I want to go shorter term time frame? Or do I want to go longer term time frame? How do I match all these objectives and business plans together with what I actually do? And it may not be what you and your broker or financial planner came up with right. maybe something very different. And you start realizing, well, wait a second. Now I either I'm going to have to find a different person to work with because there's the, the strategy of the one that I've got now is not exactly matching up with what I want, or I need to take a little control myself and do some of this myself. And then you start the steps of, well, what would I need to do that? Well, you need a buy sell engine. You need to be able, if you're doing stocks, you're going to need to be able to screen the stock somehow. Well, there's lots of screeners out there. So maybe do a little bit of a review of various screeners and see which ones uh, suit your needs better. Uh, some can screen fundamentals, some can screen technicals, and some can screen both mm -hmm. fundamentals and technicals. So now you got that and you got a list of stocks that you might potentially do. Now, do you have buy sell engines to buy those? Once you have the buy sell engine and you know where your buy stop's going to go, what's your risk on that trade? Where's your stop loss going to be? How are you going to size the position properly so you don't buy too much or too little? Both are a problem. You got to have the right size. So you get that done. Now, how are you going to monitor? the position size and the risk levels and the stop levels on an ongoing basis because you might be in the position for nine months well you know it doesn't take too much history going back to know that nine months ago you might have a very very different market than you have today so as conditions are constantly changing you have to be prepared to keep monitoring and adjusting if you need to a lot of days you don't have anything to do. You just let her ride, enjoy the ride. But you, you are prepared to step in and all of a sudden say, whoa, wait a second, this position's gone crazy up. I can't move my stops up that fast according to my indicators. So now my position size is getting too much of my portfolio for this one position that's going nuts. Time to peel that position back so that it fits in the portfolio still. Right. And you take those essentially probably profits and you pocket them back in cash and you re re uh, balance it across everything. And, and now you you're appropriately sized for each position and you do that every day and, or every period, if you're a day trader, it could be every five minutes if you wanted to do it, you know, really in intraday, but whatever the period is by monitoring the ongoing position and making sure that everything is still a good diversified portfolio, you don't have that bad day out in the future where you get hit unexpectedly on your largest position and it just, boy, then then all of a sudden it's a wake-up call. Yeah, it takes away get your confidence too. Get ahead of it and put everything in place. Mm -hmm. Put the contingency plans in place before you start trading. Make sure you have backups for your, say your laptop, uh, maybe have two laptops, maybe have 
a backup like I, I do have a hotspot as well. That one time I had to use Safeway though, the hotspot couldn't work because when they cut the fiber optic that got my internet, it, it turns out Verizon was using that same fiber optic cable. So we had no cell service. We couldn't even call and wow. tell anybody the internet was out. They knew because they, they knew immediately that you know the whole city of Payson went down. We were up here in the mountains. But it turns out Safeway had a dedicated Wi-Fi system in their cafe mm. uh, because of their cash machines. They keep national. Yep. So they had a, a hardwired internet connection that went a completely different way. And they were still alive when everybody else was down. So, so everybody was huddled in Safeway trying to, trying to stream Netflix and you're out here trying Surprisingly, to. Surprisingly, no. Really? Not very many people uh, uh, rushed the Safeway. I guess they just took a day off from the internet. Yep. There you go. That's always healthy. Uh, yeah. Take a break for sure. And in your book, you talk about uh, your, your favorite three trend following indicators. And we, we've chatted about them before as well. The the dodging channels, Keltner bands and Bollinger bands. Um, how do you use these kind of building blocks uh, and, and incorporate them into a system and, and use them across different strategies? Uh, and, and what's what's kind of your, you know, your, your favorite way to throw them in there and, and, and make the most out of them? Well, since you're a, an engineer by background too, I'll point out that things like moving averages, you could run with computers today, you could run every moving average from two days to 200 days. And you could always find over a set of data in a strategy, a single best the optimal, yeah. uh, optimized moving average. It might be 37 days or something strange like that. And it'd be real easy to do that. However, that is going to be the optimum for that data set. And you're concerned about the next data set, next year, year after that, year after that. Next year, the optimum data set might be 24. And the year after that, it might be 55. Right. So it's going to move all over the place. The thing I like about Donch and Bollinger and Keltner's uh, if you study the math and you can go to investopedia.com and they give you the formulas and all the how to use them and, and all these things. Once you get the math and study it, you realize that in the case of Keltner, you have the average true range, which is a measure of volatility. In Donchin, you have the look back periods, high and low price. That's a measure of volatility because Volatile markets are going to have a wider spread between the highest high and the lowest low. And quiet markets are going to be down here tight. So the right. dungeons will definitely come in. Bollinger uses standard deviation of the price movement. So that is a measure of volatility. So what do you have? You have three indicators measuring different forms of volatility and adjusting themselves on the fly for changing market conditions. And I like that. It, it increases the robustness right. of the indicator. Uh, I think the problem with moving averages is they're very, very locked in. Uh, when I started looking at it and trying to figure out ways of making my indicators flexible and stumbled on, I think uh, Donchin was the first one and uh, tried to understand the math and how that was adjusting itself. Then, that led me to to find Keltner and Bollinger was the most recent, I suppose. And I actually got to meet uh, Bollinger himself. So that was at a conference and that kind of triggered me to, to evaluate that. That was many years ago, like 20 or more. Um, but anyway, the, the what I like to then say, all of these indicators have sort of a high and low band. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's the high side of the noise band and the low side of the noise band. Everything in between the lines, these indicators are basically saying, ignore it because that's just normal market nonsense, you know, that, that we go through every day. Starts getting above the upper line, you're in an uptrend. If it gets below the bottom line, you're in a downtrend. If mm. it's between the lines, you're going sideways. You haven't done anything different than what you were doing before. So to me, what I do is I try to balance those out with various parameters by historically trying to see if there's a, a reasonable mix of trades that are triggered by all three of these individually. So I take whatever the closest indicator would be. So I tighten the noise band down. There may be several indicators still 
hanging up in here, but this is the Donchian, and this might be the Bollinger on the downside. I don't care. It's between that is noise, and I'll take the first one hit and say, okay, the trend's changing. Let's let's take action. And by doing that, it's very clear to me that when in, you get in volatile markets, uh, you know, like the COVID crash was insane. You've got the Donchian is is I'm we're down at the bottom and markets are down 35% and I'm still got my stop up at the top with a Donchian. The Keltner and Bollinger's are screaming down like they're skydiving to catch up to where the prices are. Right. So guess what happens? Sooner or later, it, it V bottoms. We take off to the upside. It's the Keltner and Bollinger's that are triggering all my buy signals. Once you get into a sideways and it's real smooth, the Donchins can tighten up nicely and they might be the the in, in the control seat to give you your buy signals. It changes all the time, but I liked the combination because the math of each of those indicators is different enough to where they sort of back each other up on some of their weak spots. Uh, the Donchins are very fixed at certain price levels where the 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 Bollinger's particularly can get pretty fast moving. If you have volatile periods of time, they can catch up to the market a lot quicker. So um, the, having the combination just seems very comfortable to me. Yeah, perfect. And you also mentioned in your book that you like to use indicators that have fewer parameters. Does that also kind of add to the overall robustness of, of the strategy and, and, and the system? Yeah, and I think I gave credit in the book to Jack Schwager here. Uh, Jack and I had a lot of conversations uh, during the New Market Wizards interview and then, of course, after. And he had a term that just stuck with me so beautifully called degrees of restriction. And he said that every single parameter you add to an indicator or to a trading strategy, you make it more and more complicated. So you, you start with something simple like a moving average, then you add a filter to only do the moving average if this is the case. And then you add another filter and say that, you know, and then and this has got to be in place too. As you add each parameter, you are adding a, adding a degree of restriction on robustness. It now is then focusing on a historical set of data that where that filter made sense. But you could probably think about scenarios where those filters are going to cause you to miss a great trade. That's going to be your problem over the long run. Your robustness goes down. You're going to miss some trades that pay the freight for all those losers you're going to have also as a trader. And uh, so I try to keep the parameter sets as low as I can possibly do it. Yeah, perfect. And, you know, I think a common question when it comes to systems trading that people have is um, how do you ensure that, uh, well, obviously it's automated, but how do you build confidence in the signals so you're able to take them every time? Because you don't know which trade is going to pay for all those losers, those all small losers uh, in, until it happens, until after the fact. So how do you build confidence in the signals and build confidence in yourself and developing the systems uh, so you, you know that's going to take care of itself and, and you know, overall you'll have an increasing equity curve? Yeah, I would say there's several aspects to that, and I'll draw on a little bit of the late, great uh, Van Tharp here on some of that stuff. He had a great saying that kind of went along the lines of, if you have a positive expectancy, so in other words, your risk to the stop is R, and your expectancy is, say, 1.5. So it means for every trade that you do, you've got... 1.5 is going to be your winner and one is going to be your loser. And if you've got your percentage reliability where you need to have it, then do as many possible trades, do a thousand trades. So that expectancy happens. It's like being the casino yeah. and knowing there's an expectancy that you're only going to, you're going to take in hundred percent of the revenues on the slot machines and pay out 92% of those revenues. That means you need to have a thousand people playing slot machines and you're just going to pick up that 8% difference over all of their play like clockwork, because you've got the thousands of data points that you need to do. So I like to think in terms of my next 1000 trades. It does a lot of things for you mentally. It means that this trade is not that important. 
don't get stressed over this one trade. Uh, think about what do I have to do to do the next 1000? So positive expectancy needs to be there and that builds confidence. But then also thinking about your next 1000 trades also builds confidence because it, it de-emphasizes any one trade and it takes away the fear of everything's writing on me making the right decision here. It's just another trade. It, you know, it's like taking another breath. Do you get all, uh, you know, I mean, if you don't take the breath, you could die if you think about it, but nobody thinks about breathing. It's just a natural thing you do all the time. And it's kind of the same thing a trader does with his next trade. It's just another another trade in your next 1000. Yeah, I love that. And how, how do you go about estimating future expectancy? Uh, because obviously you can back test, but uh, there can be bias that gets input to the system based on the data set you're looking at. Uh, what do you do kind of to, to kind of gauge the potential effectiveness uh, of, a, of a new strategy or an existing one? Yeah, I take historical simulations with a very large grain of salt. Um, they're a more of a guide to how the math and the logic works. And I like to look at how many trades am I going to get per year out of that strategy? So I get a sense of how much time is this going to cost me? How much potential trading errors might I have to go track down? Because, you know, if, if I'm day trading lots of markets or something, then you'd end up with hundreds of trades a day, maybe. I don't want to do that. So you have to kind of use historical simulations to give you a sense of what the strains on your time, the strains on the portfolio, what kind of margin levels is, that it used historically, those types of things. You'll never know future expectancy. That's right. impossible. You can take historical uh, expectancies and kind of look at it from the standpoint of, did it give you the simulation what you expected it would give you? For instance, if I'm a long-term trend follower, across the commodities markets, I've run enough studies to know that I'm going to come in probably between 30 to 35% reliable. And I'm probably, if I'm longer term, going to pick up some huge gainers. They're going to be 2R, 3R, 4R, maybe 7R profits. They're going to be, you know, let the profits run, cut the loss, a short thing. So your expectancy is going to be a lot, um, a little bit higher in that case and you want to be able to make sure you're in on every trade as you get into the shorter term time frames i find the expectancies now get tighter and tighter but the reliabilities go up sometimes so you mean i'm i see a lot of like my short-term trend following would be more like 40 41 percent reliable still less than 50 interestingly enough mm -hmm. but then you get an expectancy up in the if you can get the 1.2s 1.3s stuff like that, now you just have to kind of do a whole lot of trades. You just got to get to your next 1,000 trades. Well, that's going to be easier to do on the shorter term because you're going to get a lot more trades. Mm -hmm. So you got to do that. And then that gives you the sort of the marching orders for that particular strategy. In the case of the short-term ones, you're going to get a lot of trades and you're going to have a much more slight profitable edge but you're going to multiply that out by a lot of trades. The long term is going to be dependent on a few trades that really clean up, but you're in general going to do a lot less trades, so a lot less work, very different personalities. It's like having nine kids and you, you love them all, but they all do different things and they all have different personalities. It's sort of that kind of thing with trading strategies. Yeah. So I, I, I build my confidence that way. I try to, in historical simulations, get the expectancies and take them with a grain of salt and see what ballpark I'm in. And, and it kind of tells me what I'm probably going to expect in general. I don't get obsessed with the exact number. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, I think, yeah, I've never, I've never really thought about that way for the longer term strategies uh, that, that occur, you know, on a higher time frame you're looking more for a good risk versus reward edge, as you mentioned, but you're not necessarily expecting a 60% a win rate, 70% win rate, which is, yeah, that, that's pretty high, but 40% when you've got that good risk reward, that's perfect. If, um, I, if I ever saw a 60% reliability out of a long-term trend following model, after having run probably thousands of cases over my lifetime, 
I would up. say there's a flaw in something. The program screwed up, the data's messed up or something. I'd go look for the problem. Right. I wouldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And and to finish the thought, yeah, on the on the short term trades where the, the edge is a slider, you're just looking to turn over the portfolio and, and get into the next trade. Uh, and you can have a higher win rate uh, just, just on those times. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And I, I think that helps people out. Um, who are, who are kind of developing, you know, just discretionary trading systems, right? Because uh, if they're more short-term day trade focused, they're going to, you know, emphasize win rate. And if they're more longer term, they want to get that risk reward in order. So, yeah, I, I think that's super cool. Um, let's see. I think uh, one thing I did want to touch on is, uh, and it's something you talk about in the book, is total portfolio risk. Uh, so I'd love to hear kind of how you approach you know, not just risk on a single position, a single trade, but how do you think about it with regards to the overall portfolio to make sure, you know, that's never getting out of order and, you know, yeah, really. This came from uh, my money manager days when you have everybody scrutinizing your track record six ways from Sunday. And um, I tried to analyze, okay, everybody's obsessed with this drawdown thing. Where do drawdowns come from mathematically? If I've got, say, 26 futures positions that I'm trading right now, and all of them, because they're all going my direction, I've made a ton of money, it's been a really good month or two, and the stops just haven't kept pace. You know, so that all these markets are, say, going up and their stops are down here. Well, the stop moves up a little bit, but the market moves up that much. Now, all of a sudden, the distance between where I am on the closing prices on each of these markets to my stop in each of those markets has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So instead of having maybe, you know, 8% risk over my whole portfolio with this strategy, now it's gotten up into the 15 or 16. I I just set a level myself of 17. I It was an arbitrary decision, but I felt like around 17%, less than 20 in other words, if every one of these positions in my portfolio went back and hit the stop, that's what I'm going to take a hit, 17% right. right off the gate. Now, that requires 100% correlation, which doesn't usually happen, uh, so that I've got that working for me to keep it less than 17. The other thing that you'll find is that when you get into times of crisis, where markets reverse on a dime, a bank has collapsed, a, a war breaks out, Saudi Arabia shuts off the spigots or whatever. I mean, there's there's just so many different things that can happen out there. Another pandemic. Um, what ends up happening then is you end up potentially going closer. All your markets will tend to get closer to 1.0 or minus 1.0. And I call it lockstep. Mm -hmm. It's a term we sort of invented at Trendstat to just be able to talk about the conditions that exist, usually for a few days, maybe a week, where all the markets go your direction as a trend follower, or they go against you all at the same time. So you have some of the wildest swings in your NABs and your, uh, your assets and equity during those periods. And so the interesting thing is you can do all the correlation work you want in your life, but when the crisis comes and everything starts correlating at 1.0 or minus 1.0, that work on correlation goes out the door. Right. And it just seems like, okay, you, you might have done history right, but you're not dealing with this very well. So I just assume that it's 1.0. And if you just add up the risk on every position and assume that it's 1.0, then I know I can max out at 17% maximum risk to uh, equity. And I just add them all up, boom. If it's over that, I peel off proportionately all the positions down to where I get below 17 again. Yeah, perfect. What that, that tends to do mathematically uh, is it will reduce your next drawdown. Because sooner or later, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen when all the markets are hitting their peaks and you're slaying it. You're making so much money, you can't believe it that's when your drawdown is going to start. And by making sure you've managed that total risk, you've actually slightly minimized your next drawdown, the start of the drawdown. 
Yeah, perfect. And and that 17% um, number, you know, that fits well, you know, with, with what I kind of personally like to do. If I can stay within 10 to 15% of account all time highs on a draw on when the market goes into correction, I feel like I've done a great job because oh, yeah. you, you've set yourself up well to capitalize from, you know, when we come out of that drawdown and, and there's the next trend. So uh, yeah, yeah, that that's super interesting. And uh, going back to uh, developing strategies and all that, and this might add complexity uh, to the system, unfortunately, uh, have you thought about using any kind of artificial intelligence based strategies and, and taking a look at those or you're kind of sticking to, to the indicators and the approach that you've developed over over decades? Yeah, we we tried to flirt at Trendstat with uh, very early forms of AI um, and it was in pattern recognition mode. And we created such large historical databases, we almost couldn't find the PC data uh, bases to, to keep all the data and, uh, and not blow up the machines, sort of. But what we came to the conclusion was, is that the computers or AI could actually recognize from when we tried to describe what market movements had happened and have it then store the subsequent price action that comes out of that uh, pattern, let's say, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. save up all the patterns and then look at a pattern for the future. Like today's pattern would be number 317, go down the database, it matches up. And uh, historically speaking, when 317 um, occurs, 67% of the time it does this, uh, right. you know, plus whatever, how many percent. And what we found happening was very interesting, I thought, but kind of makes some sense, I guess. Everything gravitated towards 50-50 mm -hmm. over time. If you did an out of uh, sequence, you know, just did the first year and learned in the first year, and then you went and did it the second year, and you did it in the third year and you plotted all of these different reliabilities that, of what was happening, it was constantly gravitating towards randomness. It was not helping at all. So I became disillusioned with that and we stopped that effort. Uh, in addition, I would argue that uh, I just did a, a, a chat GPT question of who is Tom Basso? <laughs> and I got a response and that a, a hedge fund manager and a money manager and all that stuff. And it interestingly enough said, and Trendstat manages uh, up to $600 million for clients worldwide. Manages is not appropriate, managed. Right. Because I'm retired for 20 years. So it missed that. So it wasn't quite perfect. And then there was one other thing it talked about the various books that I had written, but did not include the new one because the information was too new. And I'm sure six months from now with, you know, the all weather trader being a bestseller in four categories, you know, chat GPT will figure that out, find it someplace, see that it's being sold, see that I'm the guy that's selling it and tie that all together. And the response will include three books now, and it'll give the names appropriately, but it's, it's still not there you see so ai is nothing more than to me a very very smart program done by human beings who created it who goes out and scours the entire universe of internet sites and information and articles and books and everything else and absorbs it into a massive cloud-based database right it is only going to be as good as all of those databases and all those websites. And if there's inaccurate stuff, like apparently what chat GPT picked up on my background, you know, it was good. It covered a lot of good stuff, but it wasn't perfect. And I think that's the problem with, with AI in terms of trading too. I don't think it's a panacea. I don't think it's going to be able to do some of the things that I've been able to do as a human being and being creative to create the code and the strategy right. that suits my needs. Uh, I think um, trying to rely on AI to do that is, for starters, if everybody uses the same AI, it's going to come up with the same answer. How's that going to work? Right. If somebody's trying to buy, who's going to sell? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. 
Yeah, and, and kind of what you mentioned, you know, it might miss one or two things, which kind of introduces randomness or introduces more risk to your system. It might need more oversight and, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I think that's interesting um, and makes sense for sure. Uh, We'll, we'll see. We'll see. I'm sure there's people developing a lot of AI systems, and uh, I think Jim Simons he's had a lot of success with it. But uh, it, you got to kind of you know focus on your circle of competence and and get the best well, at that. You know, yeah. If you asked AI to create a Keltner indicator for you in C sharp language, that's a different problem to solve. Right. That's got a finite, potentially correct solution. And if you give it certain variables and you want back from some AI the exact code and you want it to return these variables, well, then maybe it programs that whole indicator for you. That could be a good use of it. Mm -hmm. But feeding it information on the on the stock market and having it predict what's going to happen next, I'm not a fan. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And um Going back to uh, the basics of, of developing a system, mm -hmm. um, I, I was interested in asking you this question. So do you think somebody, before they try to design a system and, and you know all its components, do you think they should start with that? Or do you think they should uh, trade discretionally for a little bit, kind of gain experience, get a feel for risk management, um, you know, proprietary systems that work before trying that? Uh, to gain that experience before going ahead and trying to develop a systems trading? Or do you think it doesn't really matter? Just starting with that systems trading approach can, can work very well. I think ideally you want to match up your own personality and expertise uh, with what you're going to do. So I've known a lot of guys that had to get off the floor. I mean, I'm, I'm of the age where we used to put the orders through pits. And, um, and guys would scream at each other and wave their hands and stuff like that. Uh, now it's all computerized. But when these guys are going out of the pits, it, uh, it sort of, there were a lot of fish out of water kind of. They were used to seeing what Joe was doing over there and then copying him or, yeah. or always going the opposite of the way Joe went or whatever. They had their visual cues and sound cues. If the sound was louder, there was more stuff going on. The liquidity was up excitement uh so having that expertise and then applying it off market like now they're going to trade out of their house on a, on a computer that's very different skill set there's no noise at all you probably have i don't know some light jazz going playing in the background or something right um so i think what you find is you've got to understand your own skill sets and what you really like to do. If you've got all day to kill and you are definitely into watching the markets, discretionary trading might suit you a whole lot better than somebody who, I'm very busy. I got the house remodel going on. I've got all sorts of stuff in the move up here to the mountains. I, I've had some really busy days. So for me to get it down to 15 minutes would be just wonderful. So for me, trading... And again, I'm a technical guy. I'm an engineer. You are an engineer. To me, I'm strong in computer science and math skills and logic and process. So I've designed everything I, I've done here with my trading strategies to suit my situation, my skill sets, my personality, the whole thing. It's, it's trying to fit all of what I do like a, a glove to the hand perfectly. I think... If you had a guy who had no idea what a computer does or how to program it, no idea about math skills, a guy right off the floor, and you try to all of a sudden tell him you got to run all these noise bands and Keltners, and he would have no clue. Right, right. Uh, it would feel very uncomfortable and probably shouldn't go that way. So it, it comes down to, I think, again, assessing your situation, your objectives, your kind of what I would call a a personal inventory of everything about you, your life and everything that should lead you more to what you want to do with trading. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. then you'll waste a lot less time. Don't try to mismatch. Don't try to copy me. Everybody always wants to know what my parameter sets are. And they're over there and say, so that means we need to buy here. No, you don't need to do anything. Tom's going to buy here. You can do whatever you'd like. It's your money. 
you can change the indicator. You can make nine days, 10 days if it feels more comfortable to you. I don't really care. It doesn't, there's not a, there's no law that says you have to have a 10 day parameter or a 21 day parameter or a 50 day parameter. Um, you know, I, th I think that's where people make a big mistake trying to copy great traders, um, learning from the concepts and the psychology and the mental and the pieces of things that they have in place is useful. Trying to copy their parameter set, if it doesn't fit you is useless. It's probably counterproductive because you're trying to do something that you're not capable of doing or that you really don't feel comfortable with in the end. You're just going to make it hard on yourself. So I think yeah. designing it from who you are first just makes it a whole lot easier. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really important point. And um, one, one of the last uh, topics I want to touch on with you is uh, the, the different ratios that you mentioned in your book, the Sortito ratio, the Sharp ratio. Uh, you've also got your uh, Enjoy the Ride comfort ratio, which I liked. Um, yeah, could you kind of talk, talk through those and kind of how you use different ones to gauge the effectiveness of a system beyond just, yeah. you know, expectancy and reliability and, and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I, I'm big on return to risk. I, a lot of people focus on returns only and, you know, they go through some fairly sizable drawdowns and hopefully they have the courage and guts to stick with it and um, see those returns materialize. But I do return to risk from my client days when I had clients worried about how much risk I'm taking on all the time. Uh, return to risk became a controlling kind of uh, the number one objective in when I was doing research, try to come up with better ways to control return to risk, to increase return to risk. And the common ones, you know, the famous one is, of course, sharp ratio. And mm -hmm. you look at the math behind a sharp ratio, I don't know why anybody would use it, uh, especially for things like futures trading, where you're two directional because you've got stock markets that go down and up. And they're saying that risk is the same, whether it's up or down, that's ridiculous. Sortino improves on that by taking only the positive or the negative standard deviations as your risk, which makes a lot more sense. If you look at uh, the MAR ratio, which is the average return to the maximum drawdown, the maximum drawdown is only going to occur once in history. So once you have that, you're going to be painted with that for the rest of your life, I guess, mathematically. So that's kind of weird. And then there's return to average drawdown. Okay, mm, a little better than MAR now because you got your average drawdown. So maybe a little bit underemphasizes that worst drawdown, but at least it brings in the fact that a lot of your drawdowns aren't that bad. And maybe right. over time, some of these smaller drawdowns start swamping the big drawdown and you feel like, okay, uh, this is pretty good. Uh, I went beyond all of that and I said, what exactly do clients come to me and either like or dislike? And I said, uh, let's call this the enjoy the ride or ETR comfort ratio, because clients are all about comfort. Mm -hmm. If you're making money, they're always comfortable. So I measured each day the potential from where you started to the new high. And I created a small piece of number that said that was the comfort level for that day. And I added it to the comfort levels for the previous track record and going back to whenever the beginning was. And then how much down do most people really take to be nervous? Well, yeah, they start getting to 5% and they start looking at it a little more closely and 10% beyond, they're definitely watching it. And then there's some limit where they just hate it or it's it's they're just about to fire me. And so that's discomfort. So I made a ratio of all those days accumulated that were comfortable and all of those days that were discomfort and created a comfort ratio of the two. The higher, the better. And what you find happening is you spend a lot of time in drawdowns as a trader. You very rarely make new equity highs. So keeping drawdowns low and coming out of them fairly quickly is always a very, very useful function to improve your ETR comfort ratio. So I use that. It's just a, a quick, um, it, the number itself absolutely doesn't make any sense or doesn't, you know, if it's 0.317, if I can get it to 0.38, that's an improvement. 
if I can get it to four five, that's even better. You know, it's just it's a measurement, and you can use it to look at one strategy or one approach to another over the same time period and see what kind of different comfort levels there might have been historically using those strategies. So it's just one more measurement, but to me, it strikes more at the heart of what investors and traders really look at when they talk about return to risk. And I think most of the traditional Sortinos, Sharp definitely, Sharp is my least favorite of all. Sortino, I'd say Sortino and MAR are probably the most widely used, easy to obtain, quick look at a historical simulation. But uh, if you can program the ETR comfort ratio in there, you're, you're striking at the heart even more uh, of the problem. Uh, so that's kind of what, and I just try to, I look at my historical simulations, I try to maximize return to risk. Mm -hmm. Try to ask myself over and over again, what ways, I mean, the multiple strategy trading, what am I doing there? I'm spreading the risk over extreme diversification. Why? Because it reduces the denominator, the risk, because it's hard to make all of these things go down at the same time. It may also prevent some of the upside, but the denominator gets to be a lot more important. That risk has got to be maintained and, and uh, reduced as much as possible. And then let return go where it may right. to the extent that you can keep risk under control. And that's how you maximize your return to risk and get your numbers, you know, much more up into the level where you can be an all weather trader. Perfect. Yeah, Tom, uh, I think that's a great place to leave it. I think that's a really important point. Uh, it, it seems like with the ETR comfort ratio, you can almost tailor that a little bit to your own sp specific levels of comfort and discomfort, which makes yeah. it much more applicable to you and, and how you like to trade. So yeah, that's super interesting. And um, uh, I'd love to, you know, ask you, wh where can people learn more about uh, you, your system? Obviously you've got your website um, and definitely people should check ETR. out the new book. Uh, but, I have yeah. my own golf shirts. Um, I uh, yeah, enjoytheride.world is the website. There's lots of free information, all my interviews. This interview, if you give me a link, will be on there eventually. For sure. Uh, so yeah, all the interviews, those are all free. Uh, there's lots of recommended books. There's lots of uh, resources for the futures industry for those who want to go into futures trading for clients. There's, you know, the NFA and um, CFTC types of information. Just a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of philosophical stuff. My hedging strategy is completely outlined there. So you can see what I do with my hedging. Uh, there's, you know, Panic Proof Investing, there's a book on position sizing that I wrote, and the most recent one, The All-Weather Trader, uh, that's, you know, access to where you go buy those, but you can go on Amazon or iBooks or whatever, they're all over the place. And uh, I don't know what else, there's lots of other stuff there, uh, but that's one way to do it. You can also follow me on social media, I think I've got like 50,000 Twitter followers, just look for at Basso underscore Tom and uh, make sure you only do that one. There's lots of variations on that theme yep. that are imposters. And I've had friends scammed thinking they were talking to me and they weren't. They were just getting scammed. So be very careful. Facebook seems to be the, the worst now. Uh, they seem to be doing nothing to get my imposters off the books. But um, Twitter has been pretty good. And, and lately, uh, it's been a lot less imposters on Twitter and Twitter since Musk take over. I'm yeah, also on LinkedIn. I'm on MeWe. Uh, we got a whole bunch of places you can find me. Yeah, perfect. Well, we'll make sure to link the, the right links down below uh, in the description for people to find. So uh, Tom, thanks again for taking the time and chat with me. I always learn something new, so I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure everybody watching it as well. If you did, please go ahead and take the time to leave a like down below and subscribe to the channel. And uh, Tom, thanks again. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, Richard, it was great. Let's do it again. Yeah, sounds good. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. And uh, yeah, take care and see you guys in future videos. Peace. Thank you.